And all God's people said, Amen. Let us worship the triune God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And also to you. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. O Lord God, King of the universe, we rejoice in you here in Moscow, Idaho this morning. And we join our voices to those in every nation on earth and with those already rejoicing before your face in heaven. We rejoice because Jesus suffered, bled, died, and rose from the dead, conquering sin, death, and the devil in order to purchase all the nations of the world. We rejoice because Jesus is seated at your right hand, reigning until all your enemies have been put beneath your feet. And therefore we rejoice because all the ends of the earth will turn and remember you. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that our Jesus is Lord of all. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. Therefore, we worship you now through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end, and amen. Amen. The text this morning is from 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. These are the words of God. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit and his presence here with us today. I pray that your spirit would take that word and apply it to our hearts and lives, our families, our vocations, everywhere your need, word needs to be applied. Father, we commit it all to you in Jesus' name, and amen. amen. I need to explain a few brief things before getting to the message uh, proper. First, the, the title for the sermon is A Sermon for Americans, and it should, there are a few particular uh, references uh, th that are particularly or peculiarly American in the sermon, so, so you'll understand that as we get there. I, I know that uh, some of you are not Americans, and so I'm, I'm, I want to invite those of you who are not Americans to uh, make all the necessary adjustments as you go and apply it to your own situation, and where it doesn't apply, to simply enjoy um, watching the Americans catch it. <laughs> but, don't, but don't be too much like one kid in the family enjoying another kid getting a spanking, lest your turn come around. So this is a sermon for Americans, but it's the Word of God, and it applies to the human condition fundamentally. Second, the form of this sermon is unusual, and I need to give a brief word of explanation before presenting the message. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have four Gospels that contain many examples of our Lord's teaching, whether in parables or in explanations to his disciples uh, in private, his explanation of miracles or why they couldn't cast out the demon or whatever. But we really only have one example of a recorded sermon. We only have one example of a recorded sermon. And that's interesting. We have the greatest preacher who ever lived, and God, God gave us the record of one sermon. That sermon, of course, is the Sermon on the Mount. And it struck me recently that there really ought to be more attempts on the part of Christian preachers to imitate the Lord's homiletic style. We ought to hear this sort of thing more often. The argument against this is that it seems obviously presumptuous for a grubby mortal to even attempt to preach like Jesus did. But there's perhaps another way to look at this. Perhaps it's presumptuous to think that we have nothing to learn from him in this area. So it's presumptuous, yeah, it's presumptuous for any uh, mortal to try to imitate Jesus in anything, but I would suggest that it's even worse for a mortal to say, I don't need to. I, I, don't, I don't need to strive for that. I don't need to uh, pay attention to not, not just the content of what Jesus said, but I, I don't need to pay attention to the way in which he said it. So with that said, here is the message, and I want to begin with a Deuteronomic benediction. Blessed are those who are called by the name of the Lord, for they shall be feared. Blessed are those who listen, for they shall be chased down by blessing. 
Blessed are those who observe and do, for they shall be set on high. Blessed are those who have the word in their mouth and heart, for the new commandment is theirs. Blessed are those who are truly fruitful in their basket and store, for they will hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are those who serve God in joy and gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things, for they shall be free of covetousness. Blessed are those whose foot does not slide, for they shall walk in the truth. Blessed are those who have not looked on the form or shape of any graven image, for they shall see God. So here is the present testimony. Obedience to God can only be offered up in the present, and disobedience, that unclean sacrifice, can only be off offered on that same altar, the altar of the present. Whatever it is that is offered, clean or foul, must be offered up in the present. Were you faithful once? Were you a faithful nation back then? To offer up faithfulness then, as though it were good, as good as obedience now, to rest on your almost forgotten laurels, is the same thing as offering up fresh disobedience now. The clean sacrifices of yesteryear, offered up again in this repurposed fashion, are simply another form of unclean sacrifice. Righteousness is not shy and retiring. Offer what God asks of you. Offer your heart promptly and sincerely and do it now. Today, if you hear his voice, act as though you heard his voice today. Hearing is doing, and so it is not possible to hear one day and do on another. To hear is to do, and to not do is to not hear. What is the basis of real authority? Do not think that these are words of revolution designed to overthrow your particular laws and customs. Rather, through your assigned representatives that you voted in, you have already been diligent in overthrowing your own laws and customs while pretending that you have not done so. The impudence is such that if anybody comes to you and urges a return to the old paths, you think of him as the radical. You call him the fire eater. If someone were to come to you and urge three senators from every state, you would hail him as an innovative progressive. And the Constitution is a living document that allows for such progress. And if someone were to resist such a novelty, you would sneer at him as the extremist. So you cannot hope to understand the past, the future, or the present unless you are honest. Honesty lies at the foundation of all true authority. So what is the heart of obedience? You've heard it said that it was the intention of the founders to keep and maintain a strict separation between church and state. You have even heard it said that there was to be a wall of separation between the two. But I am telling you that there's a difference between separating two forms of government found under the sun, ecclesiastical government, church government on the one hand, and civil government on the other, and that is the most biblical thing to do, and separating God and state, or morality and state, or righteousness and state. That is another thing entirely. You who insist on separating morality and state, isn't there enough of that already? Isn't that your problem? You do not trust the founders because you believe that they were locked into their own place and time and could not see beyond the horizons of their own assumptions. And you can. They couldn't, but you can. You believe that you can break free of every cultural assumption that surrounds you on every hand, and you demonstrate your ability in this by nodding your head at every intellectual fashion that passes you by. You trust in your own heart and in the hearts of your fellows who think just as you do. But the founders, not so foolish as to trust themselves, built a form of government that instantiated that honorable distrust. And that form of government you dismiss. They built a constitution that had, its, had as its fundamental assumption that you should never trust an American. That is the basis of constitutional government. You have heard it said, and you happily echo it, that America is exceptional. You believe in this idol of so-called American exceptionalism, and in so doing, you have become one with Nineveh and Tyre. 
In thinking you are so different, you have become exactly the same. In believing that you are not as ordinary men, you have become ordinary men. Nothing is so predictable as haughty men getting above themselves. That is what they do. And so it is that nations are brought low. They are brought low when they lift themselves up, when they, wa when they vaunt themselves, when they look at themselves in the mirror while admiring what they see. This is, surprisingly to some, related to divorce and remarriage. A nation cannot be as, faithfulness, cannot be as faithless as your nation has been to your God without that faithlessness also being manifested in your marriages. You treat the dissolution of marriage as a personal convenience whether, whenever you feel like it. You ought rather to consider divorce, even when lawful, as something more akin to having a leg amputated. Although you register your marriages at the county courthouse, do not think that marriages are created at the county courthouse. God himself established marriage in the garden, and only he has the authority to dissolve it. If marriage were a creation of ours, we could modify or abolish it at will. But it is not of our making. If it is not of our making, then we need to turn to the maker of it for a right understanding of it. Because we have not done that, because we resolutely refuse to do that, the falseness of our hearts, as seen in our homes, can also be seen absolutely everywhere else. And this relates, obviously, to the issue of oath-keeping. You assume to yourselves the right to prioritize all your promises. You say that promises that are about defending the Constitution are supposed to be the really important ones, you know, in the nation's capital with you swearing on a Bible and everybody watching. But promises to remain faithful to your wife are only, quote-unquote, about sex. But a man who will betray his wife or a woman who will betray her husband is already treacherous in principle, treacherous at heart, treacherous at the core. Treachery grows just as cancer does, and oath-breaking is a gangrenous business. This is the long way around, but it is to say that a nation filled with liars, thieves, and adulterers is going to be well represented by the same kind of people in their state and national capitals, as we in fact are. How do we define good and evil? You judge yourselves by your private intentions and motives, and you judge others by their public actions toward you. You do not take their intentions or their professed intentions into account at all. In your evaluation of all your interactions with others, you weigh and measure the internal motives of others that you can't see with meticulous care, always taking proper care to leave your thumb on the scale. But because you evaluate motives in such a crooked way, it is not surprising that your retaliations toward others are so often unjust. If a man strikes you, you compare his action to the purity of your intention. If you strike a man, you do so because you've evaluated the impurity of his action and you've drawn conclusions about what his motives had to have been. Your own motives, once again, are self-evident to you as noble and right. But the twisted human race is not made up of all the others with only you accepted. The tangled relationship problems that include you are problems that very likely include you. For just one day, here's an experiment, for just one day, attribute the sincerity of your own intentions to all the others you deal with, and then attribute the obvious falseness of their hearts to yourself and to your motives. This will not be entirely accurate, as you might well guess but it is actually likely to be far closer to accurate than what you usually do. You have not arrived, but you're getting warmer. And all spiteful retaliation is from the false one. Being from the false one, it is not just wrong because it is malicious and spiteful. It is evil because it is full of lies and deceit. It is wrong, but it is also almost always wrong-headed. Personal retaliation is always sinful and almost always stupid. Spite does not just blind us to the good, but it also blinds us to the facts. And this leads us to the question of showboating. And so beware of all humility snares. You are a casual people, and you take pride in not being stuffy. But if previous generations were proud of their top hats and tails, 
and you are proud of your sweatpants, what is the real distinction between you and those others, apart from the fact that they had more of a plausible excuse for their pride? Your worship services resemble classroom lectures or assemblies, and sometimes they even look like pep rallies. And yet you are proud? No creature on earth should be proud of anything at all, ever. But to be proud of doing something poorly is a remarkable feat. Many generations of religious people have fallen into the trap of being proud of their piety. But it takes considerable gymnastic skill to be proud of your successful avoidance of that trap, being proud of your humility, so proud of the fact that you are not ostentatious or conceited, but rather open, transparent, approachable. But if you have to choose, you should choose to be rather than to seem, to be rather than to seem. For a number of generations now, you have actively pursued the surface froth of personality rather than the bedrock of character. All your success manuals presuppose this. Gestures, smiles, hearty handshakes, the lot. Your fathers used to say that success came from integrity, honesty, hard work, and all over a lifetime of service. You have traded character for personality and have come away from that sorry bargain, the poorer. Not only so, but because it was the wrong choice, it will not be long before you lose what you bought so dear. You gave up character for personality, and the time is coming and will soon be here when you don't even have that lesser good any longer. So what should you do? You should pray like this. When you reflect on your own character in the presence of God, on your failures, and on what you think are your successes, this is how you should do it. Pray to God in this way and not in a way that will seal your blindness to your true condition. Religious people love to pray in such a way as to hide themselves from themselves. Do not be like the hypocrites who use their prayers as carefully sharpened knives that they use to gouge out their own eyes. Use a measuring rod that is true. Father God, Father in heaven, you are holiness itself, and may that holiness come down and take root in me. May I measure my life by a heavenly cord and cease my attempts to measure heaven with an earthly one. As you grant me my daily bread, keep me from using it to subsidize my continuing folly. folly. Help me to see that forgiveness does not go help me to see that forgiveness that does not go out from me is a forgiveness that never came into me. Keep me from becoming ensnared by all the shiny objects around me. And let me actually see your kingdom, which is the true shining. Amen and amen. Pray this way and don't let anyone know that you do. Pray this way and let God be in charge of who might find out about it. He knows about it. And don't be greedy. Greed will out. There's no way for you to set your heart on things down here below, like a hog rooting for acorns, and not have what you are in the process of becoming being revealed to all. Stand upright instead and look at the stars. Look up to the heavens. Where is your heart? Is your heart there in the heavenly places? Or is it here below, down among the acorns? Everything down here, everything down here is within reach. You can touch it, taste it, hold it, and savor it. You can do anything at all with everything that is down here, but keep it. The only thing you can't do is keep it. You cannot touch anything above the stars. You can't touch anything in heaven physically. You cannot touch them, taste them, hold them, or savor them. You can't do anything with them except possess them forever. Your choice should not be as hard as you make it. Would you touch what you cannot have, or would you have what you cannot now touch? Why are you so beset by false urgencies? Why do you set apart important tasks for the sake of trivial but urgent tasks. Urgent and important are not the same thing. And why are you so attracted to shiny objects? Do you not know that the only way to draw the things of earth to yourself forever is by giving them away? Whatever you clutch to your chest now is for that reason somewhere else by definition. And whatever you resolve to put away from you for the sake of Christ is found there securely in your hand. And you must not give anything away because you believe it to be bad. Why would you give your corruptions to someone else and call it generosity? 
Why would your earthly goods be bad for you but good for him? No, your possessions are good, and that is why you give them away. You give them away so that others may have good things also, and so that you might have them forever. You must give material things to others in order to bless them and not to unload cursed wares from your own storehouse of confusion and condemnation. Why do you strive the way you do? Can you make the corn grow? Can you make the sun come up? Can you summon water down from the sky? The world is staggeringly fertile. The world around you is teeming with abundance. And yet you strive because you believe that if someone else gets a bigger piece of pie, this must mean of necessity that you will get a smaller one. If you believe that God is stingy with his benefits, then this would make some sense. But we are the ones who selfishly create scarcity in a, in a world full of abundance. It is not God who is selfish, but rather we who are selfish. We, God put us on a planet, 70% ocean. And because of our selfishness, we're worried about running out of salt water. This leads us right into the issue of double standards. Everyone is the protagonist in their, of their own story. Everyone is in the middle of writing a novel in the first person, writing it out of their own head. And as it turns out, everyone is their own hero. Some will say that the word hero is ill-chosen. Do not some people have very negative views of themselves? But even though it might be a negative view, who is still the protagonist? All the other characters are judged by a different standard, which is how double standards arise. We have a double standard in our narrative, a double standard in our story. We judge others by their actions and we evaluate ourselves by our motives, which as the first person narrator, we can easily see. And when we have lived this way for a long time, we discover to our own sorrow that if we didn't have double standards, we wouldn't have any standards at all. So don't waste your breath. How many hours have you spent trying to correct people who did not want your correction? And you had no real obligation to correct them in the first place. What is the issue? How does this relate to reciprocity? Do not measure the warmth of God's heart by the coldness of your own. Because we are the merciless ones, we project that hard attitude into the heavens and assume that God will deal with us as we deal with one another. Now, of course, if we continue insisting upon this, that reciprocity may eventually be arranged, where the measure we use will be measured back to us as our Lord taught us. But our starting point in this is entirely wrong. Our initial assumption about God is slanderous and worse. God is filled with and overflowing with tender mercies. He is the everlasting font of all eternal pleasures and joys, and we are the ones who have stopped that fountain up in ourselves by means of our sins. We have stuffed our filthy rags into that spring, and then we complain that God must not want us to have any water. So we must not charge him with being like us. The nature of that very charge reveals the falseness of it. The Lord Jesus wants us to walk a contrary way, the world does not follow the broad way to destruction out of a statistical necessity, but rather as a function of contagion. Finding the narrow way is not like winning the lottery, as someone had to win it as a mathematical necessity. It is rather a matter of learning, by grace, how to refuse and turn away from the madness of crowds. That madness is the contagion, that madness is the contagion of revenge, envy, retaliation, accusation, judgment, spite, hatred, and malice. The narrow way is, by the grace of God, to say no to all of that. Beware of those theologians who separate doctrine from life, especially if their schematic diagram of the relationship of doctrine to life appears to be accurate and edifying enough on paper. The truer a confession is, the worse it is when it is not lived out. The very worst is when the confession that is not lived out is the confession that all truths must be lived out. You are justified by Christ alone and not by any of your own efforts in the course of your sanctification. And one of the things that must be justified is your own efforts to be good. And as they are justified, they will continue. Your sanctification is justified. You are set free to continue. 
Brackish water does not come from pure springs, and neither does foul living come from fair doctrine. Godliness is as godliness does, and godliness only does what Christ did. Many will come to the day of judgment thinking that they are prepared to parse theology with their maker. But when the moment comes, all of their excuses will die in their mouths. That day of judgment is not the point where God loses all sense of proportion, but rather when the sinner loses all sense of proportion. Confronted with the absolute need to repent of sins and sinning, and faced with the horrible prospect of eternal torment, made out of the flames of his own willfulness, the sinner who has lost his mind, soul, heart, and life, insists upon the everlasting darkness and the misery that attends it. So what is the heart of the message? These words that I've spoken are bleeding words because Christ is the eternal word and the eternal word is the word who bled. We all, trapped in our sin and folly, had no way out unless an advocate could arise from within our midst. Our corruption was radical, descending to us from Adam, our father. There could be no way of salvation unless a pure man could arise from an impure race unless a pure man can come from the impure race that we were, that we are, unless a pure one could come from that impure source, we are all of us lost. God, in his inscrutable wisdom, accomplished exactly and precisely that when he determined that a virgin would be with child, a virgin with no human father, but with a truly human grandfather. He was the sinless one and had no sins of his own to answer for. That blameless one, that man of integrity, was treated by our authorities with all the contempt that you might expect. And in that regard, nothing has really changed. He was slandered, mocked, railroaded, flogged, spat upon, pierced, and displayed on a gibbet to the principalities and powers. These spiritual authorities had no idea that they were gazing on their own destruction their own destruction that they engineered. If the, if the rulers of this present age had known what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And they were gazing on their own destruction because they were looking at the only hope of our salvation. And so it is that any man who hears these words and hears them with faith is hearing the sound of all of his sins rushing away from him. It is not possible to hear the gospel and to hear it with faith without hearing in that moment the sound of your sins departing, the sounds of your sin vanishing, what it sounds like when your sins are separated from you as far as the east is from the west. When you hear the gospel with faith, the sound you hear is the sound of your sins leaving. Christ, the sinless one, died. Christ, the sinless one, was imputed to be the sinful one, and he died. Christ, who never did any of those things which are characteristic of us on one of our average days, took all of those evils upon himself, gathered all of those sins, all of those great sins, all of the petty sins. He gathered them to his chest, and he sank down into death. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he did not bring one of your sins back with him. He did not bring anything back with him except everlasting life. On the third day, he rose again, which means that you may walk in newness of life, and you are invited to walk in that newness of life. It means that you can hear the words of this life and not have them be unto you the words of death. So application, as the Lord taught at the end of his sermon, application is foundational. If you know what to do, if you know now what you should do now, then every witness in heaven and on earth calls upon you to actually do it. We are after the lost art of Christian character and are mighty tired of the showy performances of Christian personality. Character withstands the storm. Character is given to us by the grace of God, and character withstands the storm, like an oak tree rooted. This oak tree is rooted, and personality, by way of contrast, blows off across the way like a withered oak leaf, no longer attached to the tree, forever detached from the tree. What would you be? Would you be an oak tree or an oak 
leaf. While disobedience provides the raw material for repentance, it is no real aid to repentance. Disobedience only invites more of the same deterioration. Repentance, therefore, must come from outside of the process of decay. The process of decay cannot do anything except continue to decay. And this is why a turn of heart, a change of mind, this is why when God gives us grace, it comes from outside. Our salvation comes from outside us. Our God, who is holy and pure, is outside us. Christ died outside of us. The Spirit is given from outside of us. And he gives us a spirit of repentance. And he gives that spirit of repentance, and it goes into the process of decay. And that is why we turn around, and it's the only reason we turn around. So repentance must be a gracious gift. The child of evangelical faith is righteous action. And righteous action breeds more righteous action. Obedience prepares the way for more obedience. Just as disobedience breeds disobedience, so obedience, obedience to God's gracious call, obedience to the grace of God, obedience to the gospel breeds more obedience. And this is why holiness grows. And such holiness, supremely happy holiness, multiplies 30, 60, and 100 fold. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel that you've given to us. We thank you for the death of Jesus on the cross. We thank you for all that you've given to us. I pray that your spirit would be present here with us today. Help us to understand what we need to understand in order to live in a way that pleases you. That is a sweet aroma in your nostrils, and we know that we can only do this if you give it to us, and so we beseech you to do so. Father, as we pray, we lift up the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, In the Old Covenant, everything was fiercely guarded, especially the presence of God. Remember, Nadab and Abihu were consumed because they offered strange fire, or Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark, and God struck him dead. King Uzziah offered incense, and God struck him with leprosy. Only authorized priests could go into the holy place, and only the high priest could go into the most holy place one day a year on the Day of Atonement. All of this was pointing to the enmity between God and all our sin. Something needed to happen so that there might be peace between God and man. And here we are, in the presence of God, like everything's fine, like this is normal. And that's because it is. Part of the reason for this is because we have been made priests. Are you baptized? Then you have been made a priest. But it isn't enough to merely be a priest, since sometimes even priests got killed. Just because you're a priest doesn't guarantee that there is peace. So the promise of the new covenant is not only that we have become priests to our God, but now God himself has also become our peace. By his death, Christ has taken away all our sin, all our animosity, all our enmity toward God and all men. Now we love our enemies as Christ loved us, and we are eager to forgive them just as we have been forgiven. And when we find this inside of us, we know this is God inside of us. He is our peace. In fact, Paul says that as we make our request known to God with thanksgiving, God's peace will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So in the Old Testament, priests guarded the holy place, and there's a sense in which we still do that today here at this table. But the bigger deal is that in the New Testament, the peace of God guards us. The peace of God guards our hearts and minds because that is now where God dwells. So how will you face the challenges before you this week? How will you face the trials that you will face? How will you face the temptations that are sure to come with the peace of God guarding your hearts and minds? What is he guarding exactly? He's guarding his own presence inside you. We don't guard him. He guards us. And if he is guarding us, what will we fear? So come and feast on the peace of God. 
and come and welcome to Jesus Christ. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. So let's give thanks together. Our God and Father, we praise you and we thank you that in the broken body of Jesus and in his shed blood, you have provided our peace. A peace that makes peace between us and you and a peace that makes peace between us and all other men. Father, we thank you that you have accomplished this for us and we praise you in Jesus' name and amen. Amen. Having given thanks, Jesus broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples. Pastor Doug asked in his message at the end, do you want to be an oak tree or do you want to be the leaf that's blown? It's blown around, the wind just takes it. And you know, you look at it and you say, well, I want to be the tree. Of course I want to be the tree. But if you're honest with yourself, you know you're the leaf. I mean, just drive down the street today and you'll see, there you are, just tumbling along, right? Now you're matted and you're brown and you're smashed under some car tire. That's you, right? That's me. That's who we are, right? But the offer of the gospel, what you need is to be joined back to the tree. How can you be green again? How can you be the tree? The only way you can be the tree is if he takes that brown, smashed, ugly leaf and somehow puts you back in the tree. And you go from this curled up brown to that raging red to this bright orange to yellow and then green again. That's what God offers to do in the gospel. When you place your hope and your trust in Jesus, he takes you, that floppy, wet, smashed leaf, and puts you back in the tree because the tree is Christ. And the tree makes you live again. And that's the only way to be an oak. That's the only way to stand. So that when the word comes and says, you're an oak tree, be an oak tree. You can't do that unless you're joined to the oak tree. You're the oak tree who is Christ. So that's what you've been given. That's what God's doing in you. All these aches and pains and we say, what is happening? Well, you just got stuck back on the tree again. And that's sap flowing into you. That's God's grace flowing into you. Look to him. He knows what he's doing. He's making you live again. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with you all and remain in your hearts always. And amen.